All right, I'll give it one more minute and then we'll get started. All right, it's six o'clock. Um, I want to say good evening to everyone and thank you for being here today um, to hear from the Nevada Department of Agriculture and the USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service Plant Protection and Quarantine Program addressing suppression efforts and pesticide use for control of Mormon crickets and grasshoppers on public lands. This workshop is being held virtually and is being recorded via Zoom using either computer or telephone to ensure all wishing to participate may do so um, considering the current pandemic situation that we are in. These workshops have properly been noticed and have, um, are being recorded as required by Nevada Open Meeting Law. Meetings from this minute, excuse me, meetings from this, minutes from this meeting will be posted on the Nevada Department of Agriculture's webpage following this meeting along with this recording. Traditionally, these meetings were held regionally to address local concerns, and it is our intention through this larger meeting to address overall questions regarding this program, as well as specific regional questions. My name is Megan Brown, and I am the Deputy Administrator um, for the Plant Industry Division at the department, and I thank you for being here. Um, We will be using the Zoom features for those um, that have joined through this platform. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see a participants and chat boxes, which have been highlighted here uh, on this slide. Click on those icons to open the boxes on your screen. Using the reaction button or in the participants button, you can use um, the feature to raise your hand under the reactions. Um, in the participant list, you can also select the raise hand function. We have muted everyone to reduce background noise. If you wish to ask questions or give public comment, please use the hand raising feature and then we will unmute your mic. For those participating by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. For those, um, and once we call on you, then you can press on six or star six to unmute yourself. If you have technical difficulties during the meeting, try the following. Turn off the video to see if your connection improves. Leave the video meeting and either try to rejoin or call in using a phone number or login information that was sent with the agenda. If you are having problems getting unmuted, or into the public comment queue, use the chat function to make your comment and it will be recorded for the record. Similarly, during the question and answer period, we'll watch for and address questions that come through the chat. Since there's no sign-in sheet um, for this meeting, as there would be an in-person meeting, we are using the participant list. If you're unsure of your name, or excuse me, if we're unsure of your name, we may send you a chat so that we have the correct information in the meeting minutes. If you're joining via phone, please send an email to C-I-R-W-I-N at A-G-R-I dot N-V dot G-O-V, indicating that you've participated in today's workshop. From our agenda, you'll see that we'll start with introductions following um, a meeting overview. Um, and then it will be turned over to subject matter experts to give the presentation. We will then move into question and answers at the end with public comment. We ask that you limit your comments to three minutes to ensure everybody can be heard. Again, please save your questions for after the presentation. There'll be a time for questions and dialogue um, at that point once all the information has been shared. Um, I would like to introduce my fellow team members from the Nevada Department of Agriculture. Jeff Knight is a state entomologist. Jeff has been with the department for over 25 years and runs the Mormon Cricket and Grasshopper program for the state. Curtis Irwin, who will be presenting um, the bulk of the presentation today, supports the program and helps co coordinate survey and treatment work. From the USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services, Plant Protection and Quarantine, um, I'd like to introduce Dan Murphy. He has been with APHIS PPQ 
and the plant health safeguarding and is the plant health safeguarding specialist based in the Reno office. Dan prepares the environmental assessments for Nevada and also participates in surveys, ground treatments, as well as the planning and coordination of aerial treatments. Alana Wild is the state plant health director with plant protection and quarantine and is also based out of Reno. She assists with all aspects of the grasshopper and Mormon, pro, excuse me, Mormon cricket program, both for Nevada and Utah. Question and answers will be broken into seven sections to help us with efficiency in this virtual platform. Here are the seven sections that will be addressed after the presentation. These questions will appear on the screen again, but I want to make you aware of the breakdown so you can note where to ask your questions later on. So again, they'll be broken up by general categories and then we will ask questions related to specific geographical locations. I'd like to go over what you'll see today in the presentation. It'll start with a review of 2020, move into 2021 projections and expectations, specific um, details regarding treatment and suppre suppression, the National Environmental Policy Act process and resources. We'll now turn the meeting over to Curtis Irwin from the Nevada Department of Agriculture to start his presentation. Okay, thank you, Megan. Uh, welcome everyone and thanks for joining us. As was mentioned, my name is Curtis Irwin. I hired on in 2005 as an ag inspector to help with uh, Mormon cricket suppression efforts and having been involved in the program in some form or another since then. Currently, my main duties at the department are to assist with the management of this program and our invasive pest survey programs. And with that, I'll get into the details of this program. Um, we operate under an MOU with the USDA and we're required to adhere to AFIS's policies and procedures as well as reporting and data collecting protocols. And under that, we have three main functions. The first one is we conduct surveys for grasshoppers and Mormon cricket populations in Nevada. And we do that for two main reasons, to support and justify our treatment programs and predict uh, populations in the next year. Our second function is to provide technical assistance on management to landowners and managers. Um, and we have about seven or eight species of economically damaging grasshoppers in Nevada, but only three of them are most prevalent and more likely to create issues. And that's the migratory grasshopper, the valley grasshopper, and the clear wing grasshopper. Um, the department offers identification of insects, uh, weeds, and plant pathology, path pathogens uh, free of cost. And we are a great source of information in those and many other fields. <clears throat> so please uh, feel free to visit our website and reach out to any staff here at the department. Uh, if you've reached out to somebody, uh, the wrong person, they will know who to direct you to. So uh, Those uh, first two functions are pretty straightforward. Uh, the third one gets a little complicated and I will spend the majority of this presentation covering this last function. And that is to uh, uh, subject to available funding, we suppress economically damaging grasshoppers and Mormon cricket outbreaks on federal, state, tribal, and private rangeland. And there's quite a few qualifications that need to happen for us to be able to do that. And I wanna re remind everybody that these efforts are to reduce populations to non-damaging levels and not eliminate all the uh, Mormon crickets or grasshoppers in our treatments. Um, one of the first qualifications is all our paperwork must be in place. And I'll go over that a little bit later in the presentation in a little bit more detail. Uh, the second one would be uh, treatable populations of Mormon crickets or grasshoppers in uh, the site where we're treating. <clears throat> and those thresholds will change depend on, depending on the species and sometimes the situation too. Uh, typically our threshold from uh, populations of Mormon crickets are two per square yard and grasshoppers around eight per square yard. Uh, another uh, qualification is the benefit to the rangeland must outweigh the cost of our program. 
Um, another uh, qualification is it must be clear of all threatened and endangered species. And oftentimes uh, the three that we have main issues with or run into is the Lahontan cutthroat trout, uh, the sage grouse, and the Carson wandering skipper. And then the last one, which is pretty important, is this is all depending, uh, dependent on available funding and resources. Our current funding, uh, we're projected to run out uh, sometime next year. Um, and that just depends on what we find this year. Um, we've kept this money around since 2004. Uh, we've saved a lot of it through the, uh, between the two outbreaks that we've had. Um, just for this situation right here, but we are currently running low on money for this program. All right, I'll go into our treatments and suppression. Um, our program applies pesticides both aerially and from the ground. Our requirements on how the treatment program operates will change based on what pesticide um, is used and how it's applied. And I kind of want to stress that a little bit, uh, the differences between that. Sometimes we can get uh, talking about treatments and uh, we don't specify whether it's an aerial or ground. And there's uh, quite a few differences between those two and how they're applied and the qualifications that we need to follow. Uh, all our applications are applied using rats, our reduced area and agent treatments. Uh, this is part of an integrated pest management approach. And when I talk about pesticides, I will be referring to the active ingredients and uh, will not be using brand names. Our aerial treatments, uh, we typically use a liquid pesticide and most of the time that's gonna be diflubenzeron. Um, our ground treatments uh, will typically use a dry bait and it is applied using a blower or seed spreader uh, from the back of trucks, our ATVs. And most of the time that is uh, used with the active ingredient carburetor. <clears throat> Uh, again, I want to uh, stress that our treatments are not uh, meant to suppress all the Mormon crickets or grasshoppers in an area, but reduce them to non-damaging levels. Uh, some of the pesticides that we have uh, available to use for our program are diflubenzeron. It's an insect growth inhibitor and it interferes with the production of chitin, which is used to build the insect's exoskeleton. And for that to happen, it needs to be applied before the adult life stage. Uh, it will also need to be ingested. Uh, Carbaryl, uh, this, this will work at all life stages, um, as long as the insect is eating. Um, of course, if it's not going to eat it, it's not going to, to kill it because this one also will need to be ingested. Um, our third option is malathion. This is not preferred. Um, it's possible that we won't even be able to use it, and I can get into that into the paperwork a little bit, but uh, we'd prefer not to use this. Uh, we might have another option uh, in the coming years. Um, it's always nice to have another, another uh, tool in the toolbox to use. Um, so that might come out in the next two years. Uh, we'll see where that goes. Um, our response time, and this is the best case scenario on our ground treatments, we'll try to respond within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, on our aerial treatments, it'll be two to three weeks. And these, this is the best case scenario. There are many things that uh, will delay that even longer. Uh, our treatments are conducted to protect uh, four main uh, areas. That's the cropland, urban interface, rangeland forage, and public safety. And again, that's, uh, that's not what we're treating, but what we're protecting. Um, and then identification of pests is vital to the success of any treatment. Um, again, we offer identification for insects, so please uh, submit your insects for identification. Um, part of that is timing and knowing the biology of your insect that you're trying to control. Timing is key, so you know if you know the biology of the insect, you'll be able to apply the pesticide at the correct time to get the best control. All right, I'll go into a review of uh, last year. And last year we surveyed uh, 739 sites for Mormon crickets and grasshopper populations. Uh, this is a, quite a reduction from uh, normal years. Uh, most of that was caused by delays at the beginning of the season from hiring and traveling because of COVID. <clears throat> Um, and with the lack of personnel, most of our efforts were focused in the infested areas. 
And that's why you'll see that uh, 206 of our sites recorded populations of Mormon crickets at uh, two or greater per square yard. And that's a great percentage of the sites that we surveyed. And again, that was because most of our effort was fo focused in the infested area. Uh, we had, uh, we treated 434 acres with Carborel last year. Uh, that was at 34 different sites and that's broken down in the table on the slide. Uh, treatments were made on the ground using uh, trucks and ATVs with our spreaders. <clears throat> Uh, no aerial treatments were made last year. Uh, we did have some proposed blocks, um, but because of delays in hiring and uh, because of comments on our environmental assessment, uh, our treatments were delayed to, uh, to where it was too late that we could treat. They, uh, the insects had become adults. <clears throat> some observations we made last year. Um, we saw crickets in more areas across the state. Uh, we found them in Austin, uh, Eureka, and even in the North Valleys here of Reno. But we didn't see an increase in the damaging populations, um, which is our threshold there at two per square yard. <clears throat> so the densities of them were not increasing, but the areas that we found them in were. We also observed a decrease in population last year around July, which is quite early. Uh, normally, we're uh, dealing with crickets till the end of August. And that decrease in population was not thought to be through uh, any control efforts. Here's a quick map of uh, our survey sites from last year. Um, in the center there, you can see Winnemucca, uh, north of it, Orvada, and south of it, uh, Paradise Valley. Then uh, over on the west, you can see our sites in uh, the North Valleys, uh, north of Reno. And then we also treated out near Eureka in Newark Valley last year. Uh, the treatments on this map, um, it only includes treatments by the Nevada Department of Agriculture and USDA. And it does not include any treatments made by any private applicators or other agencies. And continuing on uh, with the issues we faced last year, um, these issues listed under treatments are mostly out of our control, but I kind of want to give you an idea of the issues we face out in the field or on the ground. <clears throat> uh, the land ownership in Nevada is kind of strange. If you've looked at a map of uh, land ownership around I-80 or uh, the railroad, um, it's gridded out and it, it goes private land, public land, private land, public land, and it ends up looking kind of like a checkerboard. Um, and that creates issues and it can leave gaps in our treatment block. We attempt to get a continuous coverage when we're treating. And if we can't get that, uh, we may determine that the program is not worth continuing because the control just wouldn't be good enough to create any results. Uh, terrain, uh, if you've ever driven around Nevada, you know that access to certain areas can be pretty difficult. Um, and so it can be impossible to get up there to survey, uh, to, to get our data to justify these programs. It can also be impossible for the plane to fly. Uh, we require the airplane to fly at a certain height to reduce uh, a drift from the pesticide. And if there's a lot of elevation change, the pilot won't be able to fly it. <clears throat> uh, other issues we have, uh, buffers. We are required to, to put buffers around uh, any water uh, any sensitive species, uh, urban interface, any structure that ends up inside of our block will need a buffer around it. And again, that'll change between whether we're doing an aerial program, a ground program, uh, and what pesticides we're using. We also have a moving target. Uh, by the time we can get to a site sometimes after we've put a program together to treat, we can get there and the insects can have moved on already. And at that point, we won't be able to continue with the treatment program. Uh, that affects uh, mostly our aerial programs. Our ground treatments, again, are a little bit different. Uh, so access, um, we can get into a lot of areas with ATVs and trucks. Uh, our aerial treatments um, most likely will not, um, excuse me, 
I lost my place. Our aerial treatments will not likely be simultaneously done um, consecutively if we can, but because of staffing issues, it's nearly impossible for us to uh, do consecutive or do simultaneous treatment programs aerially. Um, we, we're restricted to one treatment in a specific area per year. And uh, if, if we've, uh, we will avoid treating areas that we notice obvious evidence of previous treatment during that season. This restriction is regardless of uh, our pesticide use too. It doesn't matter if we switch pesticides, uh, we're still restricted to one treatment in that specific area per year. Uh, communications. Um, we, we need to work on our communications with other entities that are treating. And uh, this will allow us to use our limited resources better. Um, so if you're treating on public land, please reach out to us. Uh, we wanna know, we wanna coordinate with you um, and that will help this program quite a bit. Our EA comments, up slide. Um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we had to address some comments before we could finalize that document. Um, this year we've got it posted earlier um, in hopes that we can address those comments in time. All right, on to expectations in this year. Uh, this is our best guess. We're not ever gonna be able to 100% accurately predict what these insects are gonna do. Um, but we did start seeing Mormon crickets uh, pop up again in about 2018. And we do expect to have spikes in their populations in between major infestations. Our last infestation, tapered off pretty much 2009, 2010. Um, and then again, we, ex we started seeing them again in 18. Um, we hope that this is just a spike in between um, infestations. Uh, some other things that led us to uh, possibly predict lower populations. Um, in 2019, we uh, saw Mormon cricket populations persist until October. And like I mentioned earlier, usually um, we'll notice them disappear around August. Uh, so that was a lot uh, later than usual. Uh, in 2002, um, the populations of Mormon crickets disappeared by July, uh, which is very unusual. Uh, we also had a lot of reports of predatory wasps, and that doesn't sound like that great of a deal, but they're actually very efficient at reducing the populations of Mormon crickets. So keep our fingers crossed. Let's hope for less Mormon crickets this year. On to our surveys and treatments. Uh, seasonal staff, we, uh, we're really close to getting those posted. I hope to have uh, seasonal staff on by mid-April, uh, if not earlier. Uh, our surveys have already started. We do have a, um, an employee who's on full-time, and he's been out to Winnemucca and the North Valleys already this year. Uh, so far, we haven't found anything. Uh, the weather has kind of gotten a little colder now, but uh, I expect as soon as, it to, as soon as it warms up, we'll probably see Mormon crickets start popping up out of the ground. Uh, we will be doing uh, aerial uh, treatment blocks this year if, if we can, uh, and if we can find sites that uh, are qualified. We have put the proposed blocks together for the USDA uh, to request funding for these. Uh, they are very similar to last year. We've added a couple, uh, and later on in the presentation, um, I'll bring those up too. Our ground treatments, we will be doing ground treatments again this year too. Um, our ground treatments are pretty effective at reducing populations in a specific area, but control over large areas is going to be minimal. Um, and that's just the way that pesticide works and the way we can apply it. Uh, the, the pesticide doesn't have an attractant in it, um, but it's not going to attract the Mormon crickets very far. We predict about 100 feet. Uh, On to the cost share program. We do offer a cost share for treatments on private range land. 
and we'll offer that at a one third, one third, one third split. One third will be covered by the state, one third will be covered by the federal government, and uh, the other third will be uh, required to be covered by the private citizen. Uh, for private land to be included, it must complement or be integral to the success of our proposed treatment site. And again, this is for private rangeland. And uh, for this to happen, all private funds must be secured before the treatment can begin. I'll go ahead and leave this slide up uh, for a second or two more. If you haven't already read um, the bullet points under the cost share there, go ahead and read those. <clears throat> this will be available for reference on our website. And if you have any questions on this topic, please have them ready for us during the question period. Or feel free to reach out to us later. Now on to the fun part, our paperwork. I'm gonna to touch on these documents just a little bit. I'm not gonna spend too much time on them. Again, if you have some questions, please have them ready for us during the, the question segment. <clears throat> our environmental impact statement, this is a national document that was updated in 2019. And, and our EAs are state level documents and they're tiered off of that EIS. The EAs address uh, state specific considerations such as threatened and endangered species, uh, state laws, and locally agreed upon procedures. Uh, as I move on down, uh, the pesticide use proposals, these are a district level. Um, these are required uh, from our federal land management agencies, the Forest Service and BLM, and these allow us to use certain chemicals. And uh, the PUPs can be uh, specific to the district. Each district can have their own policies so they can determine what pesticides we can use in their district. Uh, the last two on there, these are site specific documents. Our letter of request is required from public and pri private landowners before uh, any of our treatments can happen. The finding of no significant impact is a document issued by APHIS after consultation with the US Fish and Wildlife Services on a site specific proposal based on an evaluation of non target sensitive species located in and around the proposed area. Uh, and our uh, letter of request, this is required from uh, public and private landowners before. Oh, I already went over that. My apologies. All right, yeah, I know that that can be kind of confusing. On the next slide, we, I break it down a little bit. But again, if you start from the top, uh, that's our national document. And then you move on down uh, more state specific. Uh, further on down is more district uh, specific. And then those last two are very site specific documents. And again, that's here's that process just in kind of a different uh, visual. Um, the whole thing is kind of a NEPA process. It's a National Environmental Policy Act. And currently uh, we're in the 30 day comment period on our EA. Uh, that will close March 19th. At the uh, end of this presentation, uh, you'll be offered um, uh, links on how to access those documents and how to comment on them too. And throughout this whole process, we are surveying and coordinating with BLM and land managers to identify locations that fulfill treatment requirements, during which we are determining the size of infestation, identifying hazards and buffers, and creating shape files for mapping. Um, if we happen to have a, a threatened and endangered species present, that will most likely uh, result in increased buffers. All right. Here's our uh, maps of our proposed treatment areas. Um, these treatment areas were um, uh, these treatment areas presented are based off of populations from the previous year. These are not final and will change. Uh, and not all the areas in here will be treated. We may uh, add areas also based on our uh, uh, early season surveys. So I'll go through these, I'll, I'll scroll through them um, uh, fairly slowly, but these documents will be offered at the end also. 
And this is the Winnemucca Grass Valley area. This is the Orvada Paradise Valley area. Uh, Battle Mountain and Crescent Valley. Austin and New Pass. And then uh, Eureka, they're uh, in Newark Valley. All right, I'll move on to uh, what you can do to help uh, with the infestation on your property. Uh, you're more than uh, welcome to treat and control the insects on your private property, absolutely. Um, pesticides are, you can find the pesticides available at your feed store, agricultural supply store, retail nursery or garden stores. And feel free to contact these places and request that they carry certain products that you're interested in. Um, the Nevada Department of Agriculture does not supply pesticide to any private business. And we will not be doing a bait giveaway um, either. Uh, fencing, uh, th this can be labor intensive, but it does work. Um, you can use materials such as plastic sheeting or sheet metal. Um, plastic sheeting works great, it's cheap. Um, and at least 18 inches high, I would probably go as high as two feet. It does, it does work pretty well. Um, I know that uh, it's not gonna work on a huge area, but it, you can exclude them from smaller areas. Um, engage, uh, exactly what you're doing here. Um, let us know of your concerns um, and, and voice them. Uh, have your questions ready, have your comments ready. We will listen to them. Uh, trading local pest districts. Uh, many counties or cities create pest districts to control uh, nuisance pests. Uh, for example, uh, mosquitoes, uh, noxious weeds. Um, so you can get with, uh, with your local government and uh, talk about putting one of these together. Uh, and then report your sightings to us here at the department. Uh, we measure the populations of grasshoppers and crickets in uh, their densities. We measure them in per square yard. Um, and please include GPS coordinates. Uh, we prefer decimal degree, but uh, any, any form uh, can easily be converted. All right, the, the resources I was talking about, um, these will be uh, made available to all the participants uh, via an email. And in that email, we'll include all these things in there, um, possibly even some more stuff. And they, all these resources will also be posted on our website. And with that, I'd like to thank you. And I'll turn it back over to Megan. Great, Curtis, thank you for that great presentation. I'm going to share my screen again. So we are now moving into the interactive part of the meeting. And so I'm going to go over again how you can operate Zoom. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see a participants and chat um, logos. Click on one of those um, to open the boxes. Using the reaction icon, you can raise your hand if you wish to speak. Um, or you may uh, go to the uh, either participants or reactions, click and raise your hand. Um, once you have asked your questions, we ask you to lower your hand um, to withdraw the request. We have muted everyone to reduce back, background noise. If you wish to speak, raise your hand and then we'll unmute you. Um, for those that are participating on the phone, um, press star nine to raise your hand if you have a question or comment, and then press star six to unmute yourself when we call you. We'll call you by the last four digits of your phone number. Um, 
questions and comments will be uh, limited to three minutes. And when we call on you, can you please state your name and organization for the record? Again, the questions are gonna be broken apart into six main areas and then we'll have general questions. First, we'll move into questions on pesticide and alternative controls, then on to endangered species, then to cost share and the NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, and then we'll move on to our more regional questions. So the Reno Sparks area, Humboldt and Pershing County, Leander County, Eureka, and then general questions. Um, after question and answer period, um, we will then open it up for public comment. For those, um, the public comment section will not be interactive. However, our, this question and answer section will be. So we'll start with the first set of questions related to uh, pesticides and alternative controls. Getting this opened up here so I can see. The raise hand features. So, Amber, can you um, unmute Christina Latham, please? Christina, did you receive the request? I think so. Is it working? Yeah, good job. <laughs> I've never done Zoom before. So, um, uh, Christina Latham here. I am on the south side of Gold Honda. I don't know how much you guys have done and surveyed here, but we, um, uh, you guys mentioned you don't care for using melathion. How come? So, Curtis, can you answer that question, please? Malathion is a is a very hot. Uh, our, it's not very target specific. It's, oh, but it works. <laughs> yeah, um, we prefer not to use it because of the environmental concerns it, and the non-target pests that it can kill at the same time. It it, it wipes out everything. <laughs> Well, I don't know if you'd like, I said, if you surveyed the south side of Golconda, uh, we're miserable up here in these eight homes. And melathion was what I found what worked the best. And tempo. Tempo is a food grade, correct? Um, I don't, yeah, I'm not fairly, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Jeff? To. There, there we go. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, we're we're restricted by what we can use on the federal uh, land, yeah. uh, and those go through a process. Uh, and basically, like Curtis said, the malathion is such a general uh, insecticide; it has a lot of non-target problems with it. Uh, so, in the case of an emergency, uh, and this would have to be um a very probably a very large emergency uh and something that would be determined by people higher up than us even so uh to use it but as far as what you can use on your own property you can use anything that's that's registered for that site um we tend to recommend baiting because again baiting tends to be more specific to the crickets so and and we're well aware of if you looked at the one uh, map of the Humboldt County area. Uh, there is a spray block uh, or a possible spray block around the Golconda area. So uh, it will be a targeted area for for uh, uh, early surveys this year. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, the Eureka said the Carbaral. How can I get my hands on that? Well, uh, okay. Go ahead, Kerr. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'm hogging up the questions too. <laughs> yeah, you know, carbaryl is, is is a very common chemical. It's available over the counter, um, 
at all your local nurseries, box okay. stores. The carbaryl bait, you'll have to go probably to either, um, you know, one of the bigger feed or seed stores um, there in, in the Winnemucca area. Okay, uh, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank but you. It, com it comes in like 50 pound bags, so. I'll take it. <laughs> it it's, uh, it's there. All right. All right, thank you. All right, thanks, Christina. Does anyone else um, have questions related to pesticide or alternative controls? All right, um, we'll move on to questions related to endangered species. If you have questions related to endangered species in relation to Mormon cricket and grasshopper treatments, if you could raise your hand and let us know. All right, Christina, go ahead. Yeah, you have to unmute yourself again. Oh, okay. Um, the endangered species, um, how much, I do a lot of trail riding and stuff up, up here in the Golconda area too, and they gather cows. Is there a lot of endangered species up in this area, like the Sonomas, Rock Creek area? Um, so I'm going to pass this question to Dan okay. um, from APHIS. Yeah, um, so down in the valleys, we generally don't run into too many issues with T&E species, but uh, as you start getting into the higher elevations, uh, there's a lot of um, trout territory up in the mountains as you get into the colder water streams. And so usually we'll run into T&Es uh, in the canyons and at higher elevations, which is also one of those things that prevents us from getting a plane too high uh, up the hillside. But um, as far as, you know, riding trails, you're, if you're concerned about your impact, I would not be concerned about having an impact on T&E species. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, seeing no other hands for endangered species, um, I'm going to move on to the cost share and NEPA process. Is there any questions? Anyone have any questions related to the cost share and NEPA process? All right. Um, let's move on to questions related to the Reno Sparks area. Does anyone have any questions? I saw one in the chat. Um, from Sally Bates, um, and I will um, pass this to you, Jeff. Does this mean that you are not treating North Valleys or Lemon Valley since that was not included in the maps? Uh, so, so those maps are primarily, like I said, aerial treatment blocks. And we would probably, not, I mean, we sprayed some of that area in 2004, 2005, but with all the growth that's gone out there, um, it would probably be very difficult to uh, put an airplane in the air. That does not say that we won't treat as we did in 2020. Uh, we treated several areas out there um, uh, in the North Valleys, uh, uh, Hungry, Hungry Valley, uh, Red Rock area uh, for crickets. It's just, uh, it's just a matter of the only place we can treat is BLM land. And the, the amount of BLM land out there is shrinking all the time. So, but we do plan on, I mean, it's, it's, it's because there isn't, you gotta understand those blocks are proposed areas. Doesn't mean that they won't get aerially treated. And it definitely doesn't mean they won't get ground treatments. So, um, you know, we'll, we may have uh, 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 those, uh, Either one of those could happen, um, you know, uh, as we go along and as we do our surveys and come across populations. Uh, I is that hopefully that answers your question. He said thank you in the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Any other questions for um, uh, related to the Reno you know, Sparks area? 
All right, let's move on to the Humboldt and Pershing County area. Um, can you, Amber, can you unmute? Is it, is it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. <laughs> it's all right, it's on ease. Okay, I appreciate that, thank you. I'm sorry, I would have, go ahead. Um, so I live in Winnemucca and it's been awful the past three years here. It's been absolutely disgusting. And so I was just wondering how and when and if, I guess, our public lands here will be treated, especially since these public lands border our residential areas here. Because um, like I, we're avid outdoors people here, like I can't even mountain bike, I can't hike with my kids. They just crawl all over our human bodies here. So, um, and all over our homes. So I was just kind of wondering like when they'll be treated, if they can even treat the public lands. All right, so I will pass this to Jeff, and I think Jeff maybe touch on not only reporting, so a good good reporting and survey is also important, and then maybe talk about the, her specific questions related to the treatment. So the first thing you can do is, uh, if you see him, and I saw somebody already said they're hatching in around yeah, Winnemucca, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, go online, and there's a report form on our website. Uh, under the entomology uh, part of the Nevada Department of Agriculture website and fill that out say, and send it to me, send me the information. We'll get yeah, somebody out there to look at it. And that's the way it progresses through the whole summer. Okay, yeah, I had done it. I mean, I understand that like COVID hit last spring and stuff. And so I had filled out that report, but it wasn't like an automated report. I had to like screenshot it and email it to you. Well, either either way, it's it technically it's automated, but I we had some website changes and things may have, have changed out to check on it. Uh, but the best thing to do, even if you just call and leave me a message or send me an email with roughly the, the latitude, longitude, um, or where it's at, and then we'll get out and do our survey. Now, we're not going to come ground treat crickets when they're really small. Uh, there's a lot that can happen. One of the things that's happening right now, we're going to go into a two week period of possible rain, snow and cold weather. That's going to have a could or could have a big impact on um, uh, the, uh, the cricket populations that have hatched already. So what determines if first thing that has to happen in our ability to treat uh, is those EAs have to be um, signed off on, okay? Uh, once that happens, then we can start treating. And uh, if the if it looks like it's going to be an aerial treatment, we'll put in everything that needs to be an aerial treatment. Like Curtis said, it takes three weeks, roughly, to do that. In the meantime, uh, if we need to treat areas to protect areas, uh, from the ground, we can come in with our, our either our trucks or our ATVs and bait on the ground. Uh, and basically, uh, that's, that's our treatment thing. At, at ground treatments uh, in the years where we didn't have uh, the EA issue and the COVID issue, we usually responded within 48 hours to an area to treat it. Back then, also, we could treat several times. This this time we can only treat once. So we wanna really be careful about when we treat and making sure we get the most bang for our buck uh, when we're out there treating. So, so I guess what size do they need to be to be reportable or treatable? Uh, they can be re reportable as soon as you know they're a Mormon cricket. Um, and uh, we didn't have any baby pictures of baby Mormon crickets up here, but maybe we can, uh, Put some of those up on the website, Amber. Um, but anyway, there that's when to report them. So we can get out there and, and start monitoring them before they get bigger and move. We probably don't want to do any aerial treatment. Aerial treatment, we try and target what's called the third or fourth instar or when they're about half grown uh, or a little less than half grown. That's when we'd rather spray. Um, baiting, we can treat basically at any time. It just depends on the situation. Uh, we evaluate where the crickets are. If it's a little population and we can go in there and bait it right away, we'll bait it right away. 
but we do want to make sure all the crickets have hatched. Okay. That's, that's one of the key things is you don't want to put your bait out, kill the crickets that are there. And then the bait goes away. And in a couple of weeks, the weather warms up and we get another hatch. And we see that all the time. Uh, you know, every year, practically we'll see bands of crickets that are two or three different sizes. So uh, we try and wait till they, they're all hatched. That's why we'll, we'll delay a little bit on doing ground baiting. Um, and you, it might be okay. You, you might think we're, we're not out there trying to get them, but we're actually trying to, trying to get them, uh, uh, to the point where we, we only got that one shot remember. So we're going to make it, make it work. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks, Jeff. All right. We'll move on to Lander County questions. Anybody have any questions related to Lander County? All right, we'll move on to Eureka County and well, anybody who wants to raise their hand, um, we can do so. I also saw Jake Tibbetts made a comment saying more of a statement than a question, Eureka County is ready to assist with efforts, including funding in Eureka County. We'd like to focus on efforts around the town of Eureka and Diamond Valley to try to avoid the issues that we had last year. So thanks Jake for that. And I'm sure um, Jeff knows how to get a hold of you. Um, moving forward. And I noticed that the phone number with 8018 became unmuted. Their hand isn't raised. Do you need, would you, do you have a question? Um, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Katie Annis and I actually was not, I actually was doing star nine and that wasn't working. So um, uh, we have a family ranch in Buffalo Valley and I'm on the phone because I couldn't zoom in. So I really couldn't see your map. So my question is, um, we had a terrible infestation in Buffalo Valley last year. And um, I just didn't know if Buffalo Valley was included in the map from in Persia of the Pershing, of the Pershing County line. So I couldn't see. So map. picture, um, anyway, uh, Jeff or Curtis, can you, make a statement related to the maps and then if yeah it is um uh, we've got blocks around the the ranches out there and i've been in contact with jerry um on that and and we'll be watching that area uh from the get-go this year so okay great i i appreciate that it was um uh yeah this has been an interesting um <laughs> experience listening to you guys on the phone so thank you very much <laughs> yeah okay well we'll we'll be yeah, we'll we'll be out there uh, as soon as things warm up again, and and we'll we'll get some people. Uh, I'm getting tired of sitting in my office, so. Um, okay. And Megan's and then, my right. boss, so she can. You know. <laughs> um, and if you want to stay on after everybody leaves, I can make sure to get your email address so that we can send you copies of the maps too in the presentation if you're interested in seeing the entire presentation. I know it's gonna be hard over the phone, but. What, what, I know, that, I, I did try to, I did, you did email me back, Megan, but I just couldn't get on the Zoom call. I had oh. issues with my MiFi. So okay. if it's, you emailed me back, so I'm sure I'll get that information. Okay, okay. that sounds great. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. No, star nine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Amber put some fact sheets and links into the chat as well. Um, so I'm gonna move on to any general questions that were not covered under these seven topics that anyone has general questions. All right, Christina. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, let's see, I've lost notes from this meeting. Um, are you guys, have you guys uh, even surveyed Golconda? When did you survey Golconda? Last year and the year before? Either Jeff or Curtis. Uh, we surveyed, I was out at Golconda at least two or three times. Uh, uh, in the last in, in 2020 i mean 
we have a record of all of our, when we do a survey, we go out, it's, uh, it's totally electronic. Uh, the data is brought back to the department. It's on tablets or on our phones. Uh, it's brought back to the department and it's uploaded into a database that then goes into a national database. Um, so, I mean, if, if you really want to, we could show you the, the survey points that we've done through Golconda for the last probably 10 years or so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but yeah, it's, I mean, I got out there several times. Uh, I know I had other people run through uh, as we were going to and from, especially uh, the Battle Mountain and, and around. So uh, it's, it's on our list. I mean, again, we have to have certain criteria. I mean, you got to remember that, remember Curtis was talking about the two per square yard. Well, that might seem like an awful lot to some people, but uh, you know, we have to, to sort of make sure we fall into that, uh, those guidelines for our treatments. So, uh, and it's, it, like he said too, in the pre presentation, it's a moving target. They're there one day, we can get up there in 24 hours and they can be somewhere else. And oh, we, 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 we have chased them around. So we'll, we'll keep doing that. And I, I, I mean, you guys, I know you guys said staffing issues and stuff like that. How can I help? Cause I know all my neighbors here are fed up with them and they're tearing up our homes. I've had my home insurance company drop me because of the siding of my house because of these crickets. Like they're not hit or miss here on the south side. They are here from the time April hits to October. It's horrible. So what can I do to help you guys? Just let us know that they're there and we'll get yeah. something out there and we'll treat where we can treat. And if if we have the ability to treat, we will we'll do our best to, to treat. Um, okay. You know, and, and you said you, if you're, riding the trails and stuff and you see crickets if you can tell us where they're at then uh, a lot of times we'll try and you know uh, the crickets will move down from the the mountains and the foothills down into the valleys and a lot of times we try and put our treatments in the way of them so that they the the diflora benzeron will last about six weeks that's another reason for the timing thing um so if we can get it there sometimes we can get uh uh, a, a long time a, a good control for a long period of time so but let us know that's the best thing any people can do yeah uh, and i and i sent you guys that email and that 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 sheet many of times last year um yeah. but you can you can sit at my house and you can do your square footage testing and pretty much yeah. tell where yeah. they're coming from and right. I'm like I, i'm not trying to be rude or mean or whatever but we're up here on the south side it's horrible horrible well, good well thank you and um thanks for your comments and questions and look forward to getting information from you so thank you um thank you. all right let's move on to um miss manzo hi again um i just want to say in winnemucca they are definitely more than whatever it is every two or two every square foot i mean they're like smothered like they're dropping off of my <laughs> like they're everywhere um my question is so you said that they all have to be hatched to be treated so are they not hatching in stages all summer like do they all hatch at once i kind of from my observations of just being outside it just seems like they're hatching they're laying more eggs more are hatching and so there's just a variety of the life stage that's out at once okay um I'm taking it away, Megan, if that's okay. <laughs> uh, Mormon, Mormon crickets have one generation per year. Uh, the, the, the eggs hatch anywhere in Nevada. They'll start hatching as early as late February. And depending on elevation, depending on aspect, in other words, what side of the hill they're on, if they're the north side or the south side, uh, they'll hatch clear in till um, even early June, mid June. Uh, and so you will, and you'll often get a mixed population and people will think, and then they maybe go away and then you'll see some more. 
and people think there's more than one generation. There isn't. It's it's a single it's an insect with a single generation, uh, and that's why we do our best to try and make sure all the hatching has occurred, and and that way, again. If we can get that point and we get the, the residual with the Diflora benzeron, uh, if we spray, then we get six weeks of control. So, or, or roughly that. Uh, and so, you know, it's, they don't increase. We know, pretty much know how many uh, crickets are in an area uh, by uh, definitely usually uh, late April, uh, early May. Uh, we'll know what's going on. Uh, but, you know, they may move, they move, a cricket, uh, adult crickets can move up to a mile a day. So uh, you can have a band of crickets at one place uh, and in a day they may be a mile away. And there's been a lot of cases where we've gone out. It's not that we don't believe people uh, that you know, the crickets are, are there, but when we get there, they aren't there. And they move away, they may move back in. It's, it's sort of a continual thing. So, uh, but with this restriction we have of treating once, we, we wanna do it right the first time, so. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. I wasn't sure, I didn't know that, so. Yeah. All right, thank you, appreciate that. Chuck? Chuck Austin? Yep, am I on? Yep, you're on, go ahead, sir. Um, I would suggest, and I mean, a lot of us would like to help in some way. Christina was talking about it, and uh, I know you're not going to let us spread chemicals and stuff like that. But if we, if you could put together some sort of quick workshop and show us how to um, look for them and identify them, and then you wouldn't have to send a team out before to, you know, to see if they're there. You could use the people that are on the ground. And then you could probably get out there and and bait quicker. But um, that's just a suggestion. I would be sure willing to do that. Of course, you know a lot of us know what they look like for sure. You know, and <clears throat> but uh, and we're we're a lot of us or a few of us, including Ana East, uh, we're mountain bikers, and so we cover a lot of territory out there, and we see a lot of different um, country. What? we could help if there's any way we could help, we sure would like to. Appreciate that, Chuck. Jeff, do you have? Yeah, and, and we can, uh, maybe if we, I mean, once we get, I, I we're sort of hamstrung a little bit, uh, but maybe we can put together, I'll sit down with Curtis and, and Megan and Amber and, and Dan and Alana, and maybe we can put together a, a, a half hour, uh, Zoom meeting on what crickets look like. They might be dead crickets you're looking at, but most people want them dead anyway. So yeah, I've um, had a lot of <laughs> lot of experience with crickets in uh, thirty five years. We'll take. I mean, we have that form that's online. That uh, and that's the best thing to do is to fill that out, send it in. Uh, most of the time, when we get one of those forms, we're not going to go out and look and then go back to Sparks and come back here to Sparks and then go back out to treat. Uh, when we're into the into the, the groove of treating, um, between Dan and I and Curtis, uh, we'll have somebody out there and that, they'll have a bait spreader in the back of their truck. And if the crickets are there, we'll treat them. So, um, you know, that's, again, it's the, the best thing. And, and I, I I really, really stress uh, don't treat public land on your own. Uh, let us do it. We know all the restrictions. We got into some hiccups last year uh, in some areas that maybe got treated uh, by other people. We don't know. Uh, but those kind of things can really hurt a program when all of a sudden you, you get some treatments and somebody sees why were you treating here, there weren't any crickets or you're too close to the water or you were, you know, uh, et cetera, okay? So- yeah, I'm not planning on treating any crickets, but I, but I just think it would be wise to use the locals as a tool 
well, as a sighting tool because we know the area. I could tell you where the crickets are right now. You know, I mean, I could, and 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 I, you know, there's there's just um, we could provide some good information if. You yeah, could. no, and and that's the way the way to do it is through that form or yeah, or that. email me. You know, yeah. or I've done that a lot. <clears throat> yeah, but, but yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank, thanks, Chuck. Appreciate that. And and I think it's also important for for people that are on the phone that live in counties that currently have pest districts or that do subcontracting for pest control work that you can also co contact your own local areas and let them know that infestations are occurring um, and your concern about getting treatment done um, would also be another avenue to find success in your own local area. All right, I don't see any other um, hands for general questions. Um, I'm gonna open it up now. Oh, sorry, Christina, go ahead. Let's see. Sorry, my dog. Um, so uh, one of the gentlemen mentioned the predatory wasps. Now, were those like the big black ones and just the big looking normal wasps that look like the killer wasps? Is that what he's talking about? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, it doesn't have a common name other than a cricket, cricket wasp, uh, but that's uh, Palmodes Lave of Interest if you want the big fancy scientific name. But, <laughs> but it's, it's known as one of the major predators and one of the major things that control cricket populations and okay. we every and this this goes back for the 20 years i've been dealing with these things uh or maybe even further if you go back to my uh i i was on cricket uh programs in the 70s uh when i was in college so um but those those things it seems like every time we see them the next year the the cricket populations are way down and like Curtis said, we saw some drop-offs that were really strange, not related to baiting at all, but the drop-off in, in, in mid-June, uh, early July that, that just wasn't normal. So, um, okay. yeah, yeah that's, uh, go ahead. We'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed and hope the wasps did their job. So right because they them black ones and then the normal looking heat ones that are really big they they were pretty thick here up here too this summer they, i didn't see them last summer but this summer they yeah. were it but was it, crazy okay it takes a year or so for the it's this predator prey thing that you uh, they it takes a year or so for the predators to catch up with the population of the prey and then they'll they'll knock it down so. Okay, so I mean, they're a good thing in a way, but now are they, like, if my daughter gets stung or bit by one, is that like a normal bee or normal wasp? Boy, I don't, I, I don't know how you would ever get stung by one unless you grabbed it, because they're not okay. aggressive. They're not aggressive. I mean, they're not going to, they're, they're a solitary wasp. The female digs a burrow. She goes out and finds two, a cricket takes it in the burrow, goes find another one, takes it in okay. the burrow, lays an egg on it, and then starts all over again. And, and so she's, she's working on her own. So, so the, those solitary type of bees and wasps are usually very, very non-aggressive. Uh, so it would probably hurt. I mean, I yeah. don't doubt it. And you'd have to watch it like any kind of sting. Uh, if a person was allergic to the stings in general, uh, like a honeybee sting or an ant sting, then you'd want to be really careful. But you'd have to somehow catch one to 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 get and grab it to get stung. It's not going to come after you. Okay. All right. Then we'll try and keep them around. Then. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> yep. I I right. might say I I had a lot of people calling wanting to kill those wasps off last year. <laughs> That's one of the reasons we knew there was a lot of them, a lot of calls from Winnemuc about these big black, black wasps, and, and especially with the the stuff we had going on with with the uh, the Asian giant hornet up in Washington. It was kind of crazy stuff, but anyway. 
And, and so, you know, that kind of goes back to the whole um, reservation against using malathion. Yep. Malathion would significantly impact those natural predators. Yeah, excellent, Dan, thanks. Good point, Dan, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. All right, well, we'll move now to public comments. Um, this is the time for anyone interested to make public comment. The department um, will not be responding to these comments at this time. Um, and this time is set aside for those who would like to make general comments. You please limit your comments to three minutes and state your name and organization before making a comment. And I will let you know when you have 30 seconds left. And I got to get better about waiting a little bit. I know it's awkward and Zoom sometimes, but. All right, I don't see any public comment. Oh, Ms. Manzo. Um, I just wanted to say that they like, it really makes living in Winnemucca very difficult to have them crawl up your legs, crawl up your mountain bike, crawl up your house, drop off your roof, eat your entire garden, eat all the wildflowers that are out on the trails and stuff. So I just, I really hope that this year we can at least uh, pinpoint them or locate them, retreat them because it, it makes, I mean, we already live, it seems to affect the rural areas more. And it's so hard to live here sometimes. And it's, it makes it even harder to not even be able to go outside because they just swarm you like that. Um, so I just wanted to say that, that they're just absolutely disgusting and we're like just kind of fed up um, with them in rural areas. So that's all, <laughs> sorry. Thank you. All right, um, well, we wanna thank everyone um, for participating in our meeting today. Um, we understand that questions may come up after the conclusion of this meeting. Um, so it, as you can see on your screen right now, I have listed the contact information for Nevada Department of Agriculture, as well as USDA staff that may, may be able to answer any follow-up questions. As a registered attendee, we'll be sending you a follow-up email that'll include all the links um, to the documents that Curtis referenced in his presentation, um, as well as a link to how to um, report sightings. Um, if, uh, Je uh, Amber, if you could put um, the contact information also in the chat, which you just did. Um, oops. Don't know how I exactly did that. Um, and I think, I think we're good to go. So really appreciate everybody taking the time today and um, be looking for an email coming from the department with those resources. So thank you.